Hi everyone, it's Wendy. I'm sorry it's been a while since I last videoed. Um, to put it bluntly, I lost my crafting mojo. Uh, but I've been getting it back, and I've been getting it back by going back to something I've done for a little over 55 years, which was crocheting. You can see some of my supplies here. I have stitch workers. I think I have two or three boxes of these. Why? I do not know. Let's zoom out just a little bit. There we go. Why? I do not know. <laughs> I seem to lose them. Let's put it that way. Um, I use the safety pin ones, though I do sometimes like the round ones um, that look like an ant sign. Um, and that. I got these off of Amazon. I bought crochet hooks. I'll show you some more. And it came, one one set came with this nice little tin. It has all kinds of uh, needles in it. I don't care much for plastic ones, but they have their purpose. Um, I prefer the metal ones. This one does have a metal one in it and some stick pins. There's a couple more metal ones in here. I like the tubes. And there's actually a bent one in there. I do have some bent plastic ones. And of course a needle threader. I like those. Uh, this is just some of my crochet hooks. I think I have enough to fill probably two more of these. Um, but it seems like I work on a project and when I'm done with that project I just put everything in the project and I forget to take the hook out. So then I go find that size hook. I can't find it. So I go buy another one and then I find it. So I have several of the same size. But the thing is, if you notice, um, they are different though. I mean, like this one is a 4.75 or number 7. Um, this is a 4.25. They look pretty much the same. Um, I also have some of this type hooks. I like these. This is an eye, a 5.5. Um, a lot of these I got off of Amazon. I like the comfort ones. I do have the ones, I do have ones without the bands on them. And that, and I, those are good for certain things. Um, I have my tatty needles. And, a set of tatty nails in here. But anyways, I was watching some videos of some of the younger crocheters. I'm talking about the kids in their teens, their 20s, um, and that. And I notice they do a lot of stitches that have been around for years in how they create them. But I know there's more out there because I've seen more. I've uh, been taught more. Can I remember them all? No. If I see a pattern with them in, I can, I remember how to do it. It's all about muscle memory. So I was thinking, okay, is there one, I know we have books with patterns in them. Do we have like a book of dictionary of crochet stitches? And yes, we do. This is the latest version of this book. It's written by two ladies out of Germany. And I believe they're both out of Germany. Um, one I do know, they live near Hamburg, which is in Germany. So I'm taking it that this one does. The other author does too. Um, and I got this off of Amazon. And this is the ultimate collection of crochet stitch inspiration. So this is not the end all and be all, but it has 440 patterns for textures, shells, bobbles, lace, cables, chevrons, edging, granny squares, and more. We even got nubs. And I'm not sure what a nub is. But, you know, it starts out with basic stitches. It does patterns with groups of stitches. And they're all color coordinated. That's, they're, all the patterns are color coordinated. So in this book, this light blue is all basic stitches. Then your shells and fans are kind of this lavender. Then you have 
um, clusters, popcorn, baubles, puffs, and nubs are is kind of this ivory. Then you got spike stitch patterns. Um, a good example of a spike stitch is the cat pattern you sometimes see, or um, there's a crocheter called Tina, and she does one with a kind of a spike stitch. It reminds me very much of like the um, Navajo blankets, I believe it is. And there's all kinds in there. Um, then this light pink is raised stitch patterns. And it's more than just cables. You have mesh and trellis patterns. Is in this blue again. Then we have cross and interlock stitches cables. St interlocking stitches and cables. So there's more than just one way to interlock. Um, like there's an all over mini cables, cross columns, uh, spike rows, locked diamonds. Um, this page has two that I'm very interested in. This one is called a ribbon cable and it looks just like a ribbon running through there. And this one is a braided chain cable which is kind of like the... Um, there's one pattern, I can't think of the name of it. I know it's biblical. Uh, a biblical name sometimes, but it has cables and you cross them and join them and interlock them, but it's done with just a chain. This is more than a chain. Then in a peach we have ripple and chevron patterns, and yes there's more than one type of rib uh, ripple or chevron. There's one here that has waves with fans. And then we have edgings and borders, which is really nice because, you know, you get done with the blanket and you're just unsure of which edging you should put on it, or maybe you're not feeling all the edges you know. This is a great way to learn a new edging and do something a little different. Like there's a shell edging with crossings. Um, there's a peacoat and edging. I mean, there's kind of a mesh one that looks almost like a butterfly. Um, so, I mean, it's nice to have this so that you can try something new. Then we have granny squares. We all know what the traditional granny square looks like. You know, it looks kind of like that, but look at this one. It's called foliage. You have this one. You have this one. Um, you have triangle with a lot of picos. I mean, the granny square can be, there are so many variations. I don't think this is the end all and be all of all granny squares, but it gives you a nice selection. Now, one thing to note with these patterns, I'm going to go back to the beginning, is it will tell you up here, what your stitch count, count is for, um, to make the motif. Now like this pattern here, which is cord look texture, it's any stitch count plus one beginning chain. But there are other ones in here, like this one. Multiple of five chains, plus one chain, plus three beginning chain. So if, if you wanted to make this, this pattern and you wanted it to be 20 long, you would have to do 100 
plus one plus three so 104 chains in order to get this pattern to be 20 motifs long also it does not give you it does not give you written instructions the whole way it actually works with charts it does give you a chart key and the chart key does take and explain how to do the stitches um, let me look for one that has like this one right here that is the diagram but then it gives you a chart key and if you're going to do anything out of here I would suggest doing a practice swatch I went and I photographed the first one we're going to do which is the slip chain ridges it's not like your usual one and as you can see here this is the diagram it tells you in the chart key that the open ovals are the chains the gray ovals with the um, parenthesis underneath it is the slip stitch through the back loop of the beginning chain only that's the only time you do that one then the other gray ones it looks like they have even rows in dark gray odd rows in light gray though those that's your repeat rows okay and like I said it tells you repeats row 3 and 4 for, for pattern so you would repeat these two rows here okay now what we're going to do is called the slip stitch ridges and this is what it looks like completed now if you will notice it is dense it is not like your normal slip stitch um, rib ribbing because a lot of times we just do it in the back loop only and it is stretchier and it's more it's it's just stretchier this is dense because I'm pulling on it and as you can see it's, it doesn't have a lot of pull whereas if you do a regular ribbing where you do the slip stitch in the back loop only it's going to be stretchier this way too is not that stretchy so if you want a dense ribbing if you need a dense ribbing this would be an ideal um, stitch to use so I have here some Premier Just Yarns from the Dollar Tree I don't care much for it but it'll work for this purposes it may just be the feel because it reminds me of fleece fleece fabric um, not a flannel a cross between a fleece and a flannel let's put it that way um, I've actually got a robe that feels like this so all I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do a little trick here because I learned in making my sample piece here I'm gonna go up to, I'm gonna start with a K hook or a 6.5 millimeter to start my chain and then I'm gonna switch to an I which is which this one is a 5.25 um, sometimes an I is a 5.5 depends upon what brand of hook now when I do my tension I lay my yarn over my little finger, wrap it around, go up and over, and I am holding my chain or even my work with my forefinger and thumb. And I find I can take and do about five chains. And if you look at my chains, they're pretty they're pretty regular they're pretty even that's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen now over the years I found I am rarely off gauge when I have to make a swatch I 
very, very rarely have to go up or down a hook size, especially if I'm using the same size hook as they are and if I'm using the same weight of yarn. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch this out for a pink hook. This is my eye. And if you notice, I do write in Sharpie markers on the other side of my hooks because this fades. As you use the hook, it fades. And I found that just, I need to do that too. But All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm not counting the yarn that's on my hook. One, two, and the second one, it says to start in the back bump or the back loop of the beginning chain. Now, when you hold your chain like this, you notice you'll see a V stitch. What you want to do is flip it over and you notice there's only one loop on the back. It's a bump. We call it a back bump. And that's what you want to work in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my work so that my back bump is facing up. I'm going to go into not the first one but the second back bump. I'm going to slide my hook under grab a loop, slide it through. Now I don't do amigurumi, um, that is, I do it but I don't do it all the time. I do just you know regular crocheting. So when I do my yarn over I take my hook under the yarn. Whereas in amigurumi you take your hook over the yarn. But I do it this way. And again, that's pers personal preference. Just like how you tend how you wrap your yarn around your other hand, how you hold your hook, that is all personal preference. Sometimes getting into that back loop can be a chore. Even if you do use a different size hook to, to do your chain. But there's a little trick. Grab that loop with your hook, kind of slide it through, and then you've made yourself a hole. I'll do it again on this one. Got the back loop up. I'm going to grab that back bump with my hook, kind of slide it through. Again, it's not because my chain is too tight, it's just that it's can be hard to grab that back bump sometimes. So doing that little trick helps a lot. Another little way you can do it is to go down that top one and then come up. So basically you're splitting the front chain. I thought my cat would be over here bugging me, but right now she's laying on the couch. Acting like the queen. Now, okay, this is the next to last one. And it can be easy to miss this last one because of where it is. But if you look here, I'm going to pull that out. You can see this side of the V, this side of the V, and then you want this one. It actually leads into the knot. That's the one you want to make that last stitch. It can be easy to miss that um, because you're thinking, oh, I'm already at the end. No, you're not. You still have one more to go. 
All right, we got that. So that is our base row. We're going to chain one and turn. It's also important to always turn your work the same way. Um, I always turn my work, if it's facing right, I flip just flip it to the left. I know some people take and flip it this other way. To me that just kind of tangles up your yarn. Whereas if you, especially if you're right handed now, because your work is, your finished row is facing right. All I do is I f just flip it to the left and I flip it so that it, as you can see the tail waves at me. Okay, the tail comes towards me. Um, if you're left handed, just do the opposite. Now, for the next row, for our pattern row, it says slip stitch into the slip stitch of the previous row which is tilted towards the back. So when you look at this, because this is the side that's facing me, I can see a line of stitches, but when I flip it over, you can actually see that I, my V's are there. So all I'm going to do, again, not counting the loop here, skipping this first, this chain one, all I'm going to do is go into that second one and I'm going to grab both loops. I'm going under both loops. I'm going under both loops of that V. Pull through single or slip stitch. I'll show you here. So like my stitch is right here. And as you can see, oops, sometimes you got to be careful. Because this is with it facing me, and you can see all these V's here. So I want my hook to come in from the top of this and catching both those loops of the V. And as you notice, I am holding my work between my thumb and my forefinger. And again, that's a per personal preference. Um, again, I'm going to do the hook thing. some reason I have tightened up those stitches. If you notice I've switched my my hold. So I can slide my hook in there. There we go. And with this one, this type of stitch, I would take and try and do as loose of a loop as you can without being oversized. Um, at least until you get to your second row. And if that fails, oops, I don't want to lose another hook. Stick here. Those plastic needles do come in handy. It's just not cooperating. There we go. Finally.
this is a hard stitch. It it's easy, but it's hard at the same time. And I know that one is gonna be a pain. You know. So I would suggest give your your uh, just a little tug. Um, The yarn that's on the hook, give it a little tug so that it's a little looser. It is that bottom stitch that's giving me fits. Make sure I'm not going into the same stitch twice. I've done that. When I was doing my sample, I somehow managed to go into the same stitch twice. Not sure how, but there we go. Like I said, try and leave your loop on your hook loose I'll do a couple more and then I'll flip it around and if you hear that that's my either my washer or my dryer I don't remember which one my husband's doing laundry Almost did a single crochet. Trying to make sure this stays in frame. Now, like I mentioned when I introduced this stitch, if people use the rips or the single uh, slip stitch a lot of times to make ribbing, and they do it either in the front loop or back loop or just back loop only, and they get that ridged uh, detail. If um, if you did it only in, well if you did it opposite or varying it where you did it in the front or in the back loop and then you did it in the front loop you'd end up doing it in the on the same side and that gives you a nice little design um, and that. but like I said this is a very thick it makes a thicker fabric and I'm just going to slip stitch that one okay let's see if the next row goes easier because I know when I was doing my sample once I got that second row done it seemed like everything went a little bit easier of course now that I say that it won't So again, you're just, the V is facing away from you, and that's what you're slip stitching into. And by not trying to pull the stitch tight is the big thing. Um, I think 
think that's why I'm having so much issues is because I end up pulling the stitch tight when I don't need to. That's the basic idea is you go through that V stitch that is now facing away from you. So that's basically like the top has been tilted. I think I just put that in the wrong space. That's all right. But anyways, you get the idea. It's and you will end up with a piece that looks like this. So basically, you know, you start with your chain. You start with your chain. Then you slip stitch into that chain, starting in the second chain from the hook. And you, you're doing it in the back bump only. Then you're going to take in chain one. The chain one does not count. Then you're going to take and slip stitch into the V that is facing away from you. So basically, because um, normally the V would be on the top, but because we're doing a slip stitch, the V is facing away from us when we're slip stitching into it. And you turn your work and you continue that way. And that will lead you into this nice piece. You can see the edges look very nice with this piece. And this is my walkie piece. I can already see where I went wrong. Um, but yeah, when you look at it, when you face in the piece, turn the piece, you've only got this one uh, stitch here. What you want to do is put your hook in to that V that is facing away from you. And I did find the more rows I did, the easier it got. Um, I'm not sure why. I think because I got into a rhythm and it became easier for me to find that stitch and just um, find where I had to insert my hook and get it through. As you can see, these ones are going easier, and I'm just going to, and it's also the yarn. I mean, this yarn's good, especially if you want to practice um, on it. And again, remember, this one, this first, your chain one does not count. You want to start in the second, in that first stitch that you have there. Like I said, I think sometimes these just pull tight and that's why they're so hard to get into. But I also, like I said, when I was doing my sample, I noticed that the more rows I did, the easier it got, if that makes any sense. I think because I learned how to place my hook um, into the stitch, I also made sure that um, my top V wasn't that as tight. But I think if you did this with a smoother yarn, it would work better 
um, because like I said, this reminds me of a cross between a, a fleece and a flannel, um, and the fleece is not the I, it feels like the fleece after it's been washed several times. I had a fleece jacket, and after I washed it for a couple of years, it felt like this. And I screwed up there somehow, but anyways, um, it felt like this yarn. It feels not quite felt it, but matted, it, if that makes any sense. An old fleece jacket. Um, it's the only way I can describe it. Reminds me of a bathrobe I have. I swear these stitches hide. So another thing to think about is maybe tilting your piece back towards you so you can see where your hook needs to go because that seems to be helping me is by just tilting it back so I can see where my hook needs to go and um, also, if you have one of the hooks with the, with the pointed end, um, I can't remember if it's the inline one or the other one, um, that might help too. Because as you can see, I can get that top one, it's that bottom one that's a little tricky. Like I said, if you use that hook trick, where as you can see, I'm grabbing that bottom one and the I'm pushing the top one on and just kind of pushing your hook through the wrong way, it kind of loosens it up just enough so that you can get your hook in there and complete the stitch. And of course you got your last one and of course it's going to be a bugger. Okay, do a, another chain one. But you, you get the idea of um, what you need to do is just to go un under that V. So you basically split in that top one and going under the next two. And like I said, it seemed like the more rows I did, the easier it got. I don't know if it was because I made adjustments while I was crocheting this, or if I just got better at it. <laughs> so there you go. This isn't my best work, but you get the idea. 
So that is the slip stitch ridge stitch. Um, I'll be doing another one and I'm not sure if I'll do it this week, but basically if I do one from the basic stitch, then I'll go to a different area of the book. So I will probably do a shell and fan pattern next. So be on the lookout for that pattern. Um, and let me know what you think. I'm going to put that in where I'm going to go next. And that. And thanks for hanging around. Hope to see you next time. Bye.